I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. All praise to Yahweh Elohim. What up, y'all? It's your boy, Pac Ray, K. Prince, y'all from the Rumble Room. You are now listening to Rumble Room Radio. Here at Rumble Room Radio, we visit the intersection of race, history, sociopolitics, and true religion. The one and only true religion being the law of Elohim given unto his chosen people by his prophet Moses at Mount Horeb, Sinai. On Rumble Room Radio, we strive to feed the flock in a way that Christian pastors have sorely failed. We, the scattered children of Israel, have been caught in a war, a boiling cauldron of affliction and adversity. And the only way out is to find Elohim in our stillness. And we find Elohim by cultivating patience and understanding. The spirit of wisdom meets his people at the corner of blessings and curses, reward and punishment. And so we vigilantly watch for his rewarding hand as well as his rod of correction. Then we consider, we discuss, advise, and hopefully by a spirit of wisdom, we gain understanding and patience. Inshallah. Shalom and welcome, family. Today's discussion is titled Hedonism, Asceticism, and How Western Society Rewards One and Punishes the Other. The purpose of this talk is to set a foundation for a subsequent series of talks concerning how we, the Israelite captives, are spiritually influenced by the fourth beast kingdom. Of course, by spiritual, I mean to say psychological. That is, how Israel is psychologically controlled. Controlled by Rome. The kingdom of iron and clay as spoken of by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. The spirit is the mind consciousness that is immaterial, but so seemingly woven into our physical bodies that with enough perverted social conditioning, courtesy of Rome, we wouldn't even have been able to distinguish between the two except for our sacred scriptures that tell us. This perverted social conditioning that I speak of is hedonism. Hedonism, or hedonistic living, is what the philosopher might call the practice of living for the pleasure principle. Living for sensual pleasure, that is, the pleasure or desire of the empirical senses. Yes, the so-called five senses. Whatever smells good, looks good, sounds good, tastes good, and feels good. Are we not taught by our hedonistic society to pursue it and pursue it wholeheartedly? Is that not why we generally avoid things and activities that deprive us of these objectives? Is that not why discipline and restraint seem so far a distance to walk? Is that not why delayed gratification seems to be such an inconvenience? Because why not have it now if it pleases you? Is that not what we're taught from the time we can tie our shoelaces? Is a hedonist not what we are encouraged and rewarded to be? See more, listen more, eat more, feel more, have more. And we are rewarded for our compliance. Can you count all of the ways? In behavioral science, we call reward reinforcement. And we define reinforcement as that which increases the likelihood that a certain behavior will happen again. Positive reinforcement gives us something that might encourage us to repeat the behavior. Like, a good beat makes a hip-hop fan listen one more time. Or like the savory taste of a burger will likely make us want to try it again. Or... Like a visually enticing photo of your favorite celebrity will make you want to look again. Negative reinforcement takes away something to encourage the repetition of a particular behavior. I repeat, negative reinforcement takes away something to encourage the repetition of a particular behavior. Think of a particular route you normally prefer to take to get home because you found that Generally, there was less traffic, less traffic being the reinforcement. 
or paying by debit card because there was less hassle with withdrawing cash from the ATM. Less hassle finding the ATM as the reinforcement. These types of reinforcement exploit our pursuit of the pleasure principle. They train us and cultivate us in the way of hedonism. Because why would anyone reject pleasure? Wouldn't that be punishing? In behavioral science, punishment is defined as anything that decreases the likelihood that a certain behavior will happen again. Positive punishment gives us something that might discourage us to repeat the behavior, like a verbal reprimand for interrupting, locking a particular cabinet so a person stops opening it, or receiving a ticket for driving over the speed limit. Negative punishment takes away something to discourage the repetition of a behavior. I repeat, negative punishment takes away something to discourage the repetition of a behavior. Think of the withdrawal of access to one's Twitter account. Or the withdrawal of access to posting new videos on your YouTube channel. These types of punishments also exploit the hedonistic inclinations trained by our social conditioning. For we are taught to be pleasure seekers. And as pleasure seekers, anything that denies us pleasure is punishing. And we avoid it. Because who would endure punishment by denying themselves pleasure? Enter the ascetic. Asceticism is the antithesis or opposite of hedonism. Asceticism is the practice or denial of of physical or psychological pleasures in order to attain a spiritual ideal or goal. And so it is 180 degrees juxtaposed to hedonism. Whatever smells good, whatever looks good, sounds good, tastes good, and feels good, the ascetic will deny him or herself to cultivate some spiritual or psychological aspect of themselves, especially discipline and restraint. All of these things the hedonist avoids. For example, one might practice silence to cultivate restraint of one's impulsivity in talking or to cultivate more mindfulness and reflection. One might also give up alcohol to practice sobriety. And alas, we have probably the most notable practice of asceticism, fasting or extended abstinence from food in order to cultivate discipline in eating. All of these forms of asceticism strengthen or increase self-discipline and self-control, as opposed to hedonism, which may weaken or decrease self-discipline and self-control. And so while asceticism, the practice of enduring punishment, better enables one to control his or herself, hedonism, on the other hand, the practice of avoiding punishment to pursue pleasure, subjects one to the control of another. And now perhaps it is evident why Rome would prefer each of us to be more hedonist than ascetic. The ascetic cultivates self-control, self-governance, while the hedonist relinquishes self-control and self-governance to another. Can you imagine a government trying to control a nation of ascetics? It would be far easier to control a nation of hedonists because a government that controls access to all the things that provide pleasure is a government that controls the desired reward, motivation, and incentive of the hedonist. Behavioral science demonstrates that if I control what you want, then you are subject to my control. But if you don't want anything that I have to offer, and it is my ultimate goal to control you, then I am subject to you. It is at this point that I must scramble to meet your standards for reward. Behold the balance of power. Hedonism versus asceticism. Which position empowers you? Which position disempowers you and empowers the fourth beast? Which of the two puts you at an advantage? Which of the two puts you at a disadvantage? All the attempts of control by the beast will take aim at the body to exploit the hedonist mind's inclination to avoid discomfort 
and seek pleasure. And so who is better equipped to withstand the psychological tribulation, the spiritual battle? Is it the hedonist or the ascetic? Moses, Ezra, and Judith fasted and thus practiced asceticism at least for a time. Judith fasted as a way of life. The book of Judith chapter 8 tells us that Judith fasted regularly five days a week, save the new moons and high feast days. Jezebel did as she desired and heeded not the word of Elohim. In the book of 1 Samuel, Eli, the high priest, was described as heavy, and his sons robbed the people of meat for sacrifice. So these four might have been considered hedonists. Moses, Ezra, and Judith were favored by the Most High, whereas Jezebel, Eli, and his sons were eventually judged with tragic deaths by the Most High. So perhaps we can see that pleasure-seeking and hedonism may lead to ill-character development and unfavorable outcomes versus good character development and eventual blessings and favor bestowed on those who practice asceticism. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 15, the Most High by his prophet Moses says, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Then in verse 20, he says, I will hide my face from them. And in verse 23 and 24, he said that he would heap mischiefs upon them, spin his arrows upon them, burn them with hunger and devour them with heat. By his prophet Isaiah in chapter 48, verses three through five, he reminds Israel saying, I have declared the former things from the beginning. And they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass, because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it to thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. And in Isaiah 48, 9 through 11, the Most High tells Israel, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. From the passages in Deuteronomy to the passages in Isaiah, what do we see? We see that the Most High recognized that pleasure and hedonism grew the heart fat. And that because of this, Israel had forsook Elohim and his will for them. And did not Elohim also know that immersing Israel into the depths of deprivation would cause them to remember their Redeemer? Is it that our King Yahweh Elohim knows the cleansing and sobering effects of asceticism on the fattened heart, drunken with pleasure? Surely our healer knows that the medicine of ascetic practice are bitter herbs for the soul. And what better way to bring his people back to repentance and sobriety than under the rod of affliction? And not we not afflict our own souls with a season of fasting and deprivation? asceticism, to train up ourselves in the way of restraint and sober thinking? How delighted might our Redeemer be to see this from his people while under the rod of his affliction? That is, this fourth beast kingdom called Rome. Behold, he sits as judge, ruling us through the hand of our captors. And under the hand of our captors, we live under a highly efficient governance system. This fourth beast that has done a thorough job of meeting our attention at every turn, vying for our steady gaze and using vices of every sort to capture it. And in order for it to be successful, it must teach us to want what it has to offer. It must condition us with the sort of thinking that suits its ends to seek pleasure. It teaches us to be hedonists. 
but in the end, everyone has a choice to make. A, to yield to the dragon, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And B, those who resist the dragon, waiting upon Yahuwah to renew their strength. Inevitably, the latter requires to a large degree deferment of pleasure and enduring punishment. So alas, we can see the great value and utility in the practice of asceticism. If there should be any questions or comments regarding this subject matter, please leave them in the comment box below. If you found this episode of Rumble Room Radio edifying, please do leave a like. And also feel free to share on social media. As for now, that is all, family. I'll see you in the Biblical Rumble Room. Until then, peace, light, and shalom. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it.